Hello again. Uh, till now, in the course, what we discussed is the deterministic IFS to produce fractal objects and also the random IFS to produce fractal objects. Uh, now, we come to a little bit uh, more realistic uh, uh, fractal uh, origination uh, where we use the real data set to create fractal objects or why is it useful because if we see in nature that there are some fractal objects created by nature maybe that is driven by some of the uh, inbuilt uh, properties of the uh, data so that's what we will uh, learn today in today's lecture and that is what we are planning to do in a short uh, lecture uh, the, the, the discussion on the driven IFS and IFS which is driven by the data so let, let's uh, begin so the driven IFS uh, was uh, basically was uh, initiated by Ian Stewart he asked a question to himself of course that uh, what happens if uh, when you are creating the random IFS and if you replace the computer's random number generator with some other number or with a some more familiar dynamical system the, the some dynamical system with which we are familiar with so what will happen if we if we, pro, pro, if we produce this uh, uh, random IFS through a non-random sequence or uh, well we may not say that it's a non-random sequence but it's a sequence which is driven by the data so that's what we call as driven IFS so the basic question was what happens if we use a non-random sequence in the random IFS algorithm so uh, in particular what we are seeing here is is it possible to run the random IFS algorithm with a sequence of data with a time series as most of you are aware we are you are, you, you know what a time series is or a signal uh, sequence uh, like the time series can be a, a, a earthquake seismogram or a daily temperature data uh, daily pressure data at a place given at a place maybe the rainfall data at a place or daily if you go into the financial world then daily clo closing prices of a stock or the in biology maybe the intervals between our heartbeats or maybe the EEG, EEG recorded for our brain scan. Uh, so there are several possibilities uh, with the, the uh, for the, the sequence of data with which we can play this random IFS algorithm chaos game. So with the patterns, that's what we want to see. Our hypothesis would be that the patterns in the resulting IFS picture should be able to reveal the patterns in the data. What are the patterns inhibited in the data? That's what we want to uh, reveal. So since we are using a data sequence to select the order in which the transformations are applied, if you remember, if you have four transformations, you apply them randomly, then you create a random IFS. If you apply them in an order which is governed by the data, your data sequence or your time series, then you, this will be called as the driven IFS because the data sequence or the time series drives the order in which the IFS rules are applied. So that is what uh, basically is the driven IFS approach and we we'll see its uh, results. So Ian Stewart's uh, experiments let us uh, discuss first. So for uh, for the for his experiments Stewart uh, has chosen the fixed points as the, the vertices of a, a, a equilateral triangle which is 0 0 0 1 and under 3 by 2, 1 by 2. So he has chosen this equilateral triangle and the corresponding IFS rules which he chose to create a Sierpinski's case gasket is this. Transformation 1 is scaling by half, transformation 2 is scaling by half and shifting in y direction by half and transformation 3 is scaling by half of the original object and shifting in x direction by under 3 upon 4 and in y direction by 1 by 4. So that's, those are the rules which uh, Ian Stewart has chosen and uh, he created this kind of uh, picture for a random number generator. He saw that we, when he uses a random number generator, about 1000 points, it gives me almost a Sierpinski's gasket with an with a equilateral triangle with these rules and the, with these vertices. 
So I think that will be uh, understood. Uh, it's it's uh, pretty comprehensible for everybody here. You can easily comprehend it, uh, and uh, we'll see what happens if instead of a random number generator, we use a non-random number. So he started with his experiment. The Ian Stewart started his experiment with a logistic map. A logistic map is usually uh, uh, utilized for modeling the population growth of a species. And there is a specific equation for that. I will give you in a moment. Here it is. So uh, the logistic map says the population at n plus 1 at level x will be 4 times the population at nth level and 1 minus xn where xn is the population level at, in the nth iteration or at, at the nth time and n plus 1 is the n plus 1 the, the next term or the next interval so that is called a logistic map and it produces a very it it, it very uh, nicely models the the population growth in any species so when he used uh, this equation instead of a random number generator then he got a very interesting uh, map here a very interesting object which indeed is fractal it, it is a fractal object you see it is uh, behaving uh, uh, with a scale symmetry so uh, if you magnify any part it will look like the whole so that is it is a fractal object uh, and uh, then he experimented with other uh, equations also for example here he used a trigonometrical equation sin t plus sin t upon t into under root 2 where t was again 1000 points he chose and this is the uh, uh, fractal object he produced and with this equation this sin t plus sin under root 3 t plus sin under root 5 t produces almost a Fischmeister gasket so maybe somehow this equation is equivalent to uh, using a random number generator so we can also this this also tells us that uh, given a fractal object uh, you can you we should be able to model it through uh, some equations or some maybe trigonometrical equations. So these equations also produce similar thing as produced by the random number generator or a pseudo random number generator or a driven uh, IFS generator. Now uh, I'm sure everybody must be thinking how do we convert these equations into this sequence of three numbers because here for a triangle you will only have three numbers, three distinct numbers. So how do we do that? Because for a chaos game, you need to move towards one of the vertices depending on which uh, transformation is applied. And here you need three transformations. Here also you need three transformations, but this is not a three transformation equation and similarly this. So how do we do that? That is usually done by, it's a, the, these pictures will be generated from sequence of numbers. First we generate a sequence of numbers, in this case three numbers which is called is the, the numbers course create into three equal size bins so these numbers are converted into three equal size bins which it, and it is called coarse graining the data set the data is coarse grained that means uh, it's, it's it's like a it's, it's like a strainer with the different hole size and you you strain something uh, when you when you try to uh, uh, segregate uh, particles of different sizes or different properties you you coarse grain them based on their individual properties so we will utilize some property of these things and we will divide the, the all these real numbers into three equal size bins and each bin will be numbered as one two three so if the number falls in bin one then we will use the vertex one if bin if, if my number next number falls in bin 2 then i use bin uh, in the vertex 2 otherwise vertex 3 and so on so i'll explain in the next slide uh, in detail how to coarse grain the data so uh, let us uh, see how do we coarse grain the data so uh, given our data sets it's a data is a sequence of numbers this y1 y2 y3 y4 up to yn it's a sequence of real numbers let's say so maybe you, you can say it's a it's a daily temperature variation so every day at one place if you measure the temperature or every hour let's say every hour you record y1 temperature y1 degree celsius y2 degree celsius y3 degree celsius and so on uh, and it's a continuous number 
how do we convert that into a sequence of let's say in case of a square you, you need a sequence of four numbers one two three four so how do we see into sequence of i1 i2 i3 i n each number will correspond to a particular number but this number will be one of these either one two three or four for a uh, four cornered square a four cornered chaos game so this sequence is called it's a it's a simple string associated with the data so whole data set will be reduced to a sequence symbol string con consists of four different symbols so the, these data values are often measured as decimals as i already told you and since we are converting these to only four values this process of turning these y k's into these i k is called core screening because you are uh, reducing the size you are coarsing it uh, so so at the range of y values for correspond the for corresponding to a symbol is the bin of that symbol so bin number 1 bin number 2 bin number 3 and bin number 4 so that's what uh, we will do and uh, next picture you will see the data set the where is the y1 lies uh, and where is the uh, how do we move in the chaos game plot so uh, i think uh, let me try again so uh, okay uh, my animation is not working here so maybe uh, the bin 1 these number correspond to this number these are the values of y1 y2 this is y1 then y2 so the my, my first number lies here in bin number 1 i divide the whole range of data set suppose this is my data set these are the uh, my number 1.1 1 by 2 1 by 3 or so on and this is my first data set suppose it is 1.8 so this is in bin number 1 and uh, uh, it, it's it's a so so wherever you are suppose you start at the center of the plot you go towards 1 then next point is uh, ne my next point is here so it lies in bin the, the range according to the range it lies in bin number 2 so from this i go towards 2 half of the distance the next point is uh, again 1 so i go towards 1 the next point is uh, this one which goes to 4 so i go towards 4 here and the next point is uh, bin number 3 i go towards 3 next point is bin number 1 i go towards 1 next point is bin number 3 i go towards 3 and so on. so that is how we go towards all the points and that is how we play the chaos game first we divide the whole range into let's say four equal parts it's a equal size binning there can be different kind of binning in fact it's a one of the way, way of uh, binning the data so in this case it is equal size bins the the range of the data is uh, divided into four equal parts and wherever the data the next data point falls we choose the uh, corresponding transformation to be applied and in the chaos game we move towards that particular transformation so that is how you code the data so uh, there are uh, usually commonly we use five kinds of course learning the first one we already discussed the equal size bins uh, what is equal size bin we divide the range of values into four intervals of equal length we may also have equal weight bins we can arrange the bin boundaries so that approximately the same number of points lie in each bin like sometimes uh, what happens uh, there may be a uh, lot many points in one of the bins and there may be very few points in uh, in the other bins like uh, the take the example of uh, earthquake magnitude like you will have a seven magnitude earthquake uh, maybe twice a year or all over the world but you will have three magnitude earthquake maybe thousand uh, times in a year so uh, there will be if if i divide them on the basis of their values then there will not be so too many or a sufficient number of points in all the bins so sometimes we apply equal weight bins uh, method and we arrange the bin boundaries so that the same number of points lie in each bin now uh, uh, now the the how do we decide the center of the bin sometimes we our data may have both positive and negative values so in that case we may have a zero centered bins for the for those data where sign of the data is important we take zero as the boundary between bins 2 and 3 place the other boundary symmetrically above and below zero so 1 and 2 below zero 3 and 4 above zero so this is a little bit different from the first two cases 
there is a family of co-strain depending on the placements of the other two bin boundaries. We instead of zero, we can also have a mean centered bin. Uh, suppose the data has a very distinct mean, then we take the mean of the data to be the boundary between bin 2 and 3 and place the other boundaries symmetrically above and below the mean, just like what we did in the case of zero centered bin. And usually it is expressed as a multiple of the standard deviation, like uh, you, you calculate your grade points in your courses uh, on the basis of the standard deviation. We may also have a median centered bins. We, in that case, we take the median of the data to be the boundary between bin 2 and 3. And again, the other two other boundaries are symmetrically placed above and below the median. And usually, we express them as a multiple of the range. So, uh, equal weight bins are a special case of that, in fact, a special case of median centered bins. So, uh, now, uh, in, in, in the next few pictures, I will illustrate different kinds of coarse graining we, uh, and uh, you, utilizing a data set which, which is consists of successive differences of 1000 numbers generated by iterating the logistic map. So, so the, the, remember the logistic map equation xn plus 1 equals to xn multiplied 4xn multiplied by 1 minus xn. So, that was the logistic map and we Create. We, we, we create a time series y1, y2, y3, y4 up to y1000. We create 1000 points which are generated by the 1000 iterates of the logistic map with equal size bins line drawn. And this is the corresponding driven, and you can say, uh, four steps of this uh, logistic map. And the population growth seems to be following a fractal pattern uh, depending on these uh, numbers. And these are equal size bins. Again, we keeping the size the, the coarse grain method as equal size bin. We have a time series instead of y1, y2, y3, y1000, we take their successive differences. Like first point is y2 minus y1, second is y3 minus y2, third is y4 minus y3, and so on, which represents a difference of population between two successive uh, generation of a species. So these are generated by successive differences of 1000 nitrates and again equal size bin, same as this one. But now see the patterns have changed a lot. It's uh, almost a different total. It's a totally different pattern. It's still a fractal, but it is a different pattern altogether. Uh, and uh, here you have these again equal size bins. But here you are seeing that the number of points in this bin is much more than the number of points in this bin. So, uh, that can be tackled with the different kind of uh, binning method or different kind of data sequence. Now, uh, same uh, the, as in the last uh, slide, uh, we have the time series or uh, successive time series of y1, y2, y1000 of the logistic map and the equal weight bin. But these bin boundaries are, are not drawn as equal weight bin. You see that now the ranges are not equal. This is a small range, this is the largest, uh, second largest range, this is the largest range and this is the uh, say maybe the, the a little bit more than the fourth bin. But number of points in each of the bin are same. So that is how we took the equal weight bin and you got a third fractal pattern. The fractal patterns are dependent on the uh, binning method as well as the data considered. Now for, for the same binning method, you consider the successive differences of the numbers. Binning method remains same. You keep the number of points same in all the bins, and you have another footstep or another fingerprints of the driven IFS of the population's uh, logistic map. So uh, the, this, these uh, three four pictures, uh, what uh, we discussed in last uh, five minutes, is to demonstrate that. It is very important to choose a proper binning method and to choose a proper uh, data set to get a meaningful picture. Uh, of course, all these pictures are meaningful, but uh, some pictures are more understandable than others. So you need to pick up your own method uh, for, for both uh, the data set or you can play with the data set according to your will and the binning method also. So now for the coming to the square functions again, the driven IFS rules, if you remember, these were the standard driven IFS rules, scaling by half, scaling by half and shifting by half, 
scaling by uh, shifting a half in y direction, scaling by a half and uh, shift in the diagonal direction, half half. So, uh, and if you you remember in the last uh, or maybe a couple of lecture back, we discussed that this particular IFS rules generate the field in unity square. And uh, as a consequence, we discussed that any departure from uniform randomness, if these rules are not applied randomly, then you will not be looking at the field in unity square or rather these departures from randomness will be visible through departures from uniform fill of the square. So instead of getting a uniform fill, you will get some other patterns uh, of, of this. Like here, this is a uniform random sequence and this you also saw in one of the probability plot and I showed you the animation of the probability plot. And this is this is when all the probabilities were equal. P1, P2, P3 and P4 were applied equal number of times or one by fourth of the total number of points. If the total number of points were 10,000, then 2,500 times uh, T1 was chosen, about 2,500 times T2 was chosen, same for T3 and T4. They are all chosen about 2,500 times. This is, So that is a uniform random sequence. But if, let's say if P1, P1 and P4 are 0 0.1 and P2 and P3 are 0 0.4, that means P2 and P3 are happening almost 80% of the times, 40% and 40%. 80% of the times you are getting P2 and P3 or, or T2 and T3. So 2 and 3 are applied uh, about 80% of the time and rest 20% P1 and P4 are applied. So here the, the, you can uh, infer the pattern here that towards P1 and P4 there is a gaps, so you see gaps and the, the, the plots are more denser in the P2 and P3 direction. Okay, so now here also you can see P1 is very little, about 10% of the time and all other three P2, P3 and P4 are 30%. So 90% of the time you get these pictures and only 10% times you get about P1. So this uh, towards P1 the plot uh, are, are uh, dissipated and uh, this triangle, this is trying to make a Sierpinski gasket towards this triangle because these are the probability. If, if you remember P1 is 0, then you will get a pure Sierpinski gasket because your game will never move towards P1, right? Now this again, uh, P1 and P3 are, P1 and P3 are less and P2 and P4 are about 80% of the time. So you see more concentrated towards 2, 4 line. This is 2, this is 4, 2, 4 line because most of the time the uh, transformations which are applied, they are preferred as 2 or T2 or T4. So these are the examples of uh, different kind of pictures which will result if your data sequence is not random and if you play a driven IFS uh, game, uh, driven IFS uh, chaos game with your uh, data sequence if uh, and uh, you can uh, model them statistically if you get this kind of picture maybe you can model with the help of the probability so that is how you uh, use the driven IFS uh, in order to model your dynamical system right. now uh, very interesting the, uh, the example I would like to uh, show here is this the driven IFS by DNA sequences. Now, how the DNA sequences would, uh, uh, how how they will uh, create a chaos game picture. So the, the example was uh, this example was explored by uh, a very famous man, H. Uh, Joel Jeffrey, and he used the genetic code. And uh, these days, in the Corona time, everybody is uh, aware of the genetics, uh, DNA, RNA, all those numbers are very common and probably by this time, uh, now we are already six months into the uh, lockdown thing and uh, the genetic, we all know that our genes are made up of, in fact, all species genes were made up of four distinct characters C, A, T and G, uh, adenine, thymine, leonine and uh, in. So, so th these are the four different uh, C, A, T and G and this is a, a perfect uh, uh, stage 
to play the chaos game, a four-cornered chaos game. So that's what uh, Jeffrey realized. And uh, the, I, I promise to show you some of our recent work uh, worked on coronavirus in the next class, not today, uh, because today we are going to uh, finish now uh, in, uh, soon. Uh, but uh, I promise you to show you in the next class our own work based on coronavirus. But uh, here I'll show you the Jeffrey's work. Uh, this is a sequence of several billion numbers or several billion of these uh, these uh, four only four distinct uh, characters they make all of us just for four of these so it, the, we, we, we see a sequence of uh, about 4000 symbols is needed to encode the formation of enzyme amylase uh, which is again a protein uh, within our body amylase and uh, that is uh, so th this is how this sequence look like the sequence are uh, out of all these four numbers only, four uh, symbols, either C, A, T or G. And they occur in a particular sequence. The, their combinations uh, define us, a particular combination. And these combinations can be used to play a, a chaos game. In fact, this is a very straightforward thing. Otherwise, uh, how do we convert a DNA sequence into an IFS picture? How do we do that? So we just read the sequence in order. We apply T1 whenever C is encountered. We apply T2 whenever A is encountered. We apply T3 whenever a T is encountered. And we apply T4 whenever G is encountered. So very straightforward thing. And uh, in fact, you can uh, play with these things. You can choose your own methodology. You apply T1 whenever T is encountered. We apply T2 when G is encountered and so on. It doesn't really matter. Only thing is, each of them will produce a fractal picture and here are the some examples on the left side what you are seeing here is a picture which results from applying these rules to that real real amylase sequence remember the amylase sequence i showed you in the last slide so this is the picture in the chaos game plot generated by that particular sequence so uh, but you, you see very interesting stuff here very few points in some of the regions where the addresses are g a if you remember, if you, if you plot these addresses here, you can always uh, show their address. If the addresses contain GA, then there are very few points in this particular thing. So if you remember the ordering of the addresses. Uh, on the right, this is, a, this is not a picture generated by the sequence or the data sequence. This is generated by a, just by a simple statement that we generate this chaos game plot randomly except one rule that T4 never follows T1 or G never follows A. So G does not follow A and that is why G does not follow A. So if G follows A, there will be many points. But since there are no points, that means G does not follow A in the sequence of this amylase. In the DNA sequence of the amylase, the G uh, G does not follow A, so that's a very interesting uh, stuff. Uh, so it's a, it's a not. Uh, of course, they they are not exactly uh, matching. They here the mathematical thing. It's exact. G A is totally blank. But here you do get few points. So nature always uh, provides some pilferage. Now some more examples. These are again taken from our heart. Uh, this. Uh, our, uh, I, I think from potassium channel, sodium channel of our uh, own DNA, say from human cardiac cells. These are the samples taken from human cardiac cells and uh, determine their DNA sequences. And from those DNA sequences, the chaos game uh, was uh, plotted. So the potassium channel, again, uh, you see some patterns. Sodium channel, here a different pattern is visible. See, here this uh, uh, portion was uh, missing a little bit. Here, it's a different portion. I think it is uh, which square was that? This is one, two, three. So three, two. Uh, it's, a, it's a two, three square. So G A uh, C A T G. It's a T square. So here A T is missing. Here G A is missing, and so on. Now here are also some other examples from uh, the uh, chromosome, uh, human chromosomes. Uh, and uh, they, these are the four examples from chromosome 7 from again from the University of Washington Human Genome site. You can all go to this site and download that. 
these are the uh, these chromosome numbers and very very beautiful carpet patterns uh, you are seeing here uh, very nice patterns you are seeing uh, that uh, um, that uh, show that our dna has some distinct features uh, which are uh, which, which are not uh, uh, random so that is how we will uh, see and uh, we will also see these kind of sequences in case of coronavirus in fact that is our own work we did uh, in last uh, uh, three four months when we were in lockdown we thought what to do uh, we have a very nice tool with us uh, to play a chaos game and we have a lot of dna sequences available for uh, coronavirus and uh, we did play this game with coronavirus and we also applied uh, this uh, uh, thing to not only to coronavirus we applied to several different uh, viruses bacteria etc and i'll show you in the next uh, lecture next lecture i promise to be very very interesting because it uh, concerns our recent uh, recent uh, problems uh, like the coronavirus what we are facing and uh, so we have uh, played something and we will see what uh, we can uh, do with this coronavirus sequences. Thank you.